let us begin so welcome to the third and final part of our course yeah first order logic or predicate logic we have finished talking about the baby version which is propositional logic and the ideas in first order logic are more or less similar whenever we study some subject that is similar to another subject that we have already studied we usually learn it through comparisons so we are mostly going to look at the differences between propositional and first order logic and we will emphasize mostly on that so uh, there are some new words here on the board yeah so first one is predicate so what is the meaning of predicate anybody wants to guess so predicate means there is a statement which has a variable and the truth value of the statement depends on the assignment of the variable so for example if i say that 2 is a prime number that is a proposition everybody is okay with that yeah it's a statement it's either true or it's false whereas if i say x is a prime number now can you tell me whether this statement is true or false no unless and until i tell you what is x right and then if x is a chair does that uh, statement even make sense so we have to range x over something sensible right if i say that a chair and table and i am talking about less than relationship x less than y and x is chair y is table it doesn't make sense we have to specify less than x less than y so x and y are coming from something meaningful right so our languages will now not have interpretation or valuations which are that easy as in propositional logic in propositional logic every statement was either true or false but here the truth is conditional the truth depends on assignment yeah that is the major difference between pre predicate logic and propositional logic so that is one aspect and uh, earlier we saw that propositional logic also i mean on its own doesn't have lot of expressive power yeah, i mean x is a prime number that itself is one instance of that but apart from that also if i say that not all prime numbers uh, not all natural numbers are prime now this statement i can use a quantifier yeah not all so all or there exist now these two quantifiers they play a very essential role in first order logic okay here i want to uh, like ask you the definition of a maximal element in a partially ordered set can anybody tell me yes so for all so a is maximal if for all x bigger equal a x equals, x equals to a now you know this definition but it contains something like for all and that for all we are varying it over what when i say for all x and x bigger equal a implies x equal to a so when i just say for all x where is that x varying over 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 the elements of the poset right okay so now i want to uh, also ask you you have studied calculus and in calculus you have seen something called completeness of real numbers yes what does completeness say yes 
least upper bound. Uh, can you state the whole thing? Every non-empty bounded subset of real numbers has a least upper bound. Now, can you try to express it using quantifiers? For all s in, in where? In the power set. Yeah, it is a property of real numbers. But we are saying for all s in the power set of real numbers, if s is non-empty, then s has a gray, at least upper bound and, and is bounded, yes, and is bounded, then s has a least upper bound. But when we are describing this particular property for real numbers, we are not really using a quantifier which ranges over real numbers. We are using a quantifier that ranges over subsets of real numbers. Now, this is the distinction between first order and higher order. Okay? So, look here. First order logic is called L omega omega. The second omega here stands for first order, which means quantification is only done over elements of the universe. It is not done over subsets of the universe. So, the quantifiers can only be interpreted as elements of the universe. Yeah, I will define what a universe is, but you have got the idea when we are saying that uh, maximal element, the x ranges over a given poset. So, that poset becomes your universe. Okay? And at the same time, uh, the first omega is something that we have already seen. So, that has to do with length of a formula. We cannot have a formula that has infinite length. We cannot say uh, conjunction of Pn where n is less than omega. We never allowed that. We did not allow infinitary conjunctions. We did not allow infinitary disjunctions. Our conjunctions and disjunctions were always finitary. So, that finitary aspect, everything is finite, that finitary aspect is captured by this first omega and the second omega stands for quantification over elements and not over subsets. Okay? So, there is a distinction between first order and higher order logic. So, we are not going to study higher order logic because it does not have completeness. Okay? Only first order finitary logic has completeness. If we go to infinitary logics, it does not have completeness. Again, one more thing I want to point out is we are not going to look at the completeness <coughs> theorem in this course because, well, proof systems, you already understood what proof systems do. We will only prove the compactness theorem and we will only study it more semantically. Yeah? So, it is the more model theoretic aspect of first order logic. We will never study single turn style. There are many good reference books available for that. If you wish to study that, you are welcome to do so. In fact, I will strongly recommend it. But we are not going to do it in this course. Okay. So, uh, we are going to start with what we do when we study logic for the first time. What was the first thing that we defined for logic, propositional logic? Language, very good. So, language usually consists of two parts, language and meta language. So, alphabet. Yeah, so, our alphabet, we are going to write down our alphabet now. So, first let me describe the meta language. So, this is the parent logic of propositional logic. So, whatever we could do in propositional logic, we should be able to do it here. 
So tell me some symbols in the meta language. Yes? For all there exists directly. <laughs> huh? Conjunction, okay. Then negation, okay, and okay, so the derived symbols, I am just going to write them in brackets. We don't want to explicitly talk about them because our work is reduced if we use an adequate set of connectives. So that definitions are not long. Okay, anything else? Parenthesis, very good. So these parentheses and anything else that you can think of. That's all we had in propositional logic. Okay, now we are going to add some new symbols. The first one is this. There is a very funny story. I was teaching in uh, VIT once, VIT Vellore for a school. And uh, one of the, I mean, professors were sitting there and one of, prof uh, one of the professor's wife was also sitting there. And she is a linguist. And when I wrote I was talking about model theory on the board and during the talk she asked her husband is this person dyslexic he, he was drawing a and e's opposite <laughs> okay we are not dyslexic this is just a symbol for <laughs> mathematics so this is existential quantifier And we are not going to use for all explicitly, it will be again a derived symbol, yeah, just like disjunction. I mean, can you tell me how, how to write for all using there exist? Negation. Negation. Negation, there exist, negation. Okay, you had to use two. Okay, so that's for all. Okay, then we are also going to use this symbol. What is this symbol called? Equality. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I really want to be pedantic, yeah, then I should write it like this. To just separate it from ordinary equality. This is just a symbol. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't mean anything. It's just symbol. But I am not going to be very strict about this. I am just going to say this equality. Okay. This is the equality symbol. See, we are uh, emphasizing on the word symbol. It is just a symbol at this moment. It does not mean anything. Conjunction does not mean and. That happens when we study semantics. Right? So, right now it does not mean anything. Then, apart from that, we will also assume that we have a countable set of variables. I mean, countably infinite set of variables. Okay, so variables, uh, our standard notations, yeah, they are usually x, y, z, yeah, these are for free variables and w is for a bound variable. I will describe what these things mean in due course of time, but simple interpretation is anything that appears immediately after a quantifier, that is a bound variable and anything that is not associated with a quantifier, that is a free variable. These are, also part of the meta These are also part of the meta language and in fact, what we really need, we do not really need a countably infinite set of variables at any given moment. What we always need is, if we want to use a new symbol that is not already available, we should have that available. 
okay at a time you are only using finitely many symbols but that finite number could be very large if we want one more then it is available so that's why we are saying countably infinite set of variables whenever we need one it's available okay so this is our meta language part and in addition we should have a language okay so what is a language now the this is this consists of two par, uh, three parts okay i am going to use some fancy symbols i j k then sigma from i to natural numbers and mu from j to positive natural numbers and that's all okay i have to describe what these things are so i is the set of i mean perhaps i should not write defines yeah i should just write i is the set of relation symbols okay j is the set of function symbols and k is the set of constant symbols okay so there are three different types when we studied set theory yeah i mean most of our attention was about two different kinds how do sets interact with each other either you can take their products in which case and we can study subsets of products so those are relations then we can also study functions between two different sets so those correspond those are represented using function symbols and if we want to talk about very specific elements of your set then we use constant symbols okay and sigma and mu are the arity functions okay so these are arity functions so for example if yeah so if r belongs to i what does that mean that r is a r is a relation symbol don't forget the word symbol because right now we want to emphasize that this is a purely syntactic construct it doesn't have any meaning and sigma of r is equal to n then we say r is an n ary relation symbol okay so n ary relation symbol so normally we study binary relation symbol yeah binary relation symbols uh, some examples of binary relation symbols are equivalence yeah triple equal then less than or equal to or strictly less than these are all examples of binary relation symbols then being prime just being prime that is a unary relation symbol prime of x yeah because either x can be prime or x may not be prime so it's a property so these are so this one yeah relation symbols these are actually called predicates that's why the name predicate logic 
Yeah, these are called predicates, relation symbols. That is the speciality of this. And uh, if f belongs to j and mu of f is equal to m, then we say f is an m array function symbol. Okay, what is going to be the interpretation of this? First, let me talk about one more definition and then we will return to some more comments about this. Whenever we are given a language, if we want to interpret quantifiers, then those quantifiers have to take values somewhere, Yeah, as we already said. So, those values must come from its domain or universe and such a thing is called a structure. So, a language, what will be our symbol for language? L, yes. So, let me write something down. And L structure M consists of the following data. Okay, there should be some data. First one is M, a non empty. set also known as yeah i mean known as the universe of m or domain of m or the underlying set of m i will use all these different terminologies while talking about this. So, it is just a non-empty set. The word non-empty is extremely crucial here. We cannot allow our universes to be empty. Okay. Then, for each R in I, a subset are m of <coughs> m to the power sigma r. So, in particular, if we are talking about a binary relation symbol r, then r to the power m would be a subset of m square. That is expected, right? So, it simply says when is the property true? If we want to say x is equivalent to y, then we say that x comma y belongs to equivalence or if x is less equal y, then we say x comma y belongs to less equal. Now, that less equal is a subset, is some subset of m square because it is a binary relation symbol. Okay? For each f in j, a function f m from, can you tell me from where to where? m to the power, m to the power mu f to m it should take mu f many inputs and give you just one output. So, for example, addition, addition of two natural numbers that is a binary function symbol. So, binary function symbol is interpreted as a binary function. 
a ternary relation symbol is interpreted as a ternary relation. So, the interpretation is just dropping the word symbol. It is no longer just a symbol, it has a concrete meaning. And finally, for each C in K, an element Cm in M. So, for example, when we talk about natural numbers, then there is a special element. What is that special element? 0. So, 0, if we write a symbol called 0 in our language, then we will interpret that symbol as the element 0 from natural numbers. Yeah, here the most difficult part in this process is to get your head around the difference between a symbol and not a symbol. Once you get used to that, yeah, then you will be okay. Okay, so in particular, we need, I mean, in order to interpret really of constant symbols, we need that M is non-empty. If M happens to be empty, we cannot interpret any constant symbol, right? Okay, so one more thing that I want to, I mean, now I am going to say some specific things. So, observe that mu is a function from j to n plus and not just n. So, n plus means only positive natural numbers. So, what happens to 0? 0 arity. How do we interpret a 0 array function symbol? Tell me. It is just a constant. Okay? So, this is equivalent to, yeah, same as a 0 array function symbol. Since Cm is a function from m to the power 0 to m, but what is m to the power 0? Any set to the power 0 is 1. It is 1. Yeah, because how many functions are there from the empty set to your set M? It is just the empty function. So, there is a unique function. So, this is 1 or any singleton. So, what is a map from a singleton to M? Well, it simply picks out one element because functions from 1 to m are in bijection with m itself. Right? So, therefore, talking about constant symbols separately is not really necessary. They are function symbols. They are in particular zero array function symbols. Any questions so far? Moreover, okay, now uh, given a function symbol, we can always look at its graph. I mean, given a function, not a function symbol, given a function, we can look at its graph. And that graph will be a relation. Understood? A graph is a relation. Yeah, if we are talking about a function from a square to a, then the graph of that function is a subset of a cube. So, ultimately it is also a relation. Every graph is a relation. Every constant is a function and every function is a relation. That is why we justify the name that it is predicate logic. Everything is just a predicate. Understood? A function is definitely something more than a relation because it satisfies some properties. Yeah, that for every element of the domain, there exists a unique element of the codomain. Now, that property we can write down as sentences later on. But every function is ultimately a relation. 
Any questions so far? Now let us look at different languages and also look at some interpretations for them. So uh, now we are going to start. So the first language is the easiest one, I, J, K, everything is empty, empty, empty. So we don't need to worry about mu and sigma maps either. So L sets is equal to empty. What is the structure for L set? What do we need out of all this data? Hmm? What do we need? Do we need a non-empty set? No? Why? There is no, no, we did not say that for constant symbols we are taking it to be non-empty. We said this is part of the data. So we need a non-empty set. But I is empty, J is empty and K is empty. So what is a structure for L sets? A non-empty set, that's all. Yeah, this is the simplest possible example we can think of. Yes. No, this is part of definition. Yeah, it's convention that we always choose a non-empty set. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to write down, uh, well, I'm just going to say L1 right now and I should give you the data for this. Yeah, so this is, uh, I mean, I equal to capital P, J equal to empty and K equal to empty and I should just describe what is sigma. So sigma of P is equal to 1. If I give you this data, then what am I telling you? What is an L1 structure? Singleton. Singleton. Yeah. Mm. See, what do we need to give the data? A non-empty set. And then for each relation symbol, I need a subset of an appropriate power. So which power should I think of? So I'm just going to say M equal to, yeah, capital M a non-empty set and PM subset of M, that's all. This is my structure. Any particular example? I'm not going to say non-empty, non-empty, non-empty always. Yeah, M is always non-empty. Every structure is non-empty. Can you give me one particular example of something like this? We already talked about it today. Primes, very good. So uh, in particular, Yeah, uh, natural numbers comma primes is an L1 structure. Okay. 
Any other example? Natural numbers and composite numbers, natural numbers and singleton 1, natural numbers and 2 comma 3, anything that you can think of, any arbitrary subset you can put next to it. So then when we ask, is the property P true for X? Then the then you will ask in which structure? Right? You understand now? In this structure, okay, what is the value of x? So give tell me a natural number 2. Okay, it is a prime number. So it is true. Yeah, so we describe our universe, then we only take values from that universe, and then we answer yes or no, depending on that. Okay, second, uh, uh, third example, maybe let us say L1 prime equal to I is empty, J is F, K is empty and mu of F is equal to 2. Now please tell me one example of a structure. What do we need? Addition. addition on? Always, yeah, do not just say addition. Natural. Okay, so uh, natural numbers and plus that is a binary function. Anything else? Naturals and multiplication. I also watched a video recently that of a professor from the US in whose class if a student's mobile phone rings, if there is a call, then they have to answer that call on loudspeaker. And if there is a text, they have to read out the text out loud in the class. Should we start doing that? Yes? <laughs> so learn to put your mobiles on silent. Okay. Any other example? I can see some people switching off their mobile phones now. You want to read your last message? How about a Boolean algebra and a meet operation? That is a binary operation. Multiplication on real numbers, addition on integers, exponentiation on real numbers. Not real numbers, exponentiation on natural numbers, let us say. No. For reals, we, yeah, I mean, we do define that. But, okay. Uh, so, and it could be really weird function as well. Yeah, I mean, it does not always have to be something nice. <laughs> I can take a two element set and define any function from that pairs to singleton. Yeah, I mean, um, any binary functions would do. Yeah, I mean, in practice, we ask for nice properties. So, for example, we will uh, require that our binary function symbol to be associative. If we say it is associative, do you know what is the name for that? associative binary function, it is called a semi-group. Okay? You have heard the word group, yeah, group is constructed in three steps. A semi-group, it is just a binary associative function, then it has an identity, so that is called a monoid and after that you take a group which also has an inverse. So, I am just going to change the name of L1 dash to something more meaningful now. And this is what we will normally do. So this is L semi groups. Okay. 
So uh, this is the language of semigroups that doesn't necessarily mean that the binary function has to be associative. I'm just saying I'm extracting the language from semigroups. Yeah, so any semigroup. Yeah, semigroup is associative binary operation. Now that we are on this topic, why not add a fourth example, which is from monoids. So L monoid. Can you please describe the language for L monoids? You have one extra constant, very good. So i is equal to empty, j is equal to singleton f, and k is equal to singleton c. Well, even though I did not describe it, I hope you know what, uh, what symbols I am going to use. Yeah, so let me perhaps write them down. We'll use r, s, and t, uh, perhaps just r and s, yeah. R and S for relation symbols, these are notations. Then here the notations will be F, G and H and here the notations would be C and D and E. Okay, we are dividing the alphabet, our English language alphabet appropriately. So that if you see a symbol E, then you know it, it is a constant symbol. F is a function symbol, that's how we usually learn. Yeah, so let's make it E. Yeah, over here, let's make it E. So, uh, any example of a monoid? Any monoid is an L monoid structure. But it doesn't have to be a monoid. L monoid. Again, another example is maybe I can just say n plus and 3. Why not? What do I need? I just need a binary function and I need a constant. They don't have to be related to each other by any means. Yeah, the data is raw data. It doesn't need to have any properties. If I like, I can say R. Yeah, then I can say multiplication and then I can say pi. Anything is okay. As long as it is a binary operation and one element. So this is to make you understand that structures are not models. Models will be structures which satisfy some properties, some axioms. We are not yet there. Yeah? Right now, we are just talking about raw data. Okay. Then, can you tell me what will be the language of groups? I is empty. J is We need a binary function symbol, so I am just going to write 2 on top of it and inverse function and inverse is what binary or unary? Unary, yeah. So I am just going to say G and this is unary and uh, yeah, let me close this and K will be E and that's all. So any group? is something like that. So, so any group is an L group structure. Then I can also do something very weird. Yeah, so then I can say plus, then I can say shift. Yeah, shift operator. Shift means one which takes n to n plus one. Right? And yeah, maybe if you don't know, then n maps to n plus 1. And then I can say 5. 
This is also an L group structure. They have no connection with each other whatsoever. It's an arbitrary data. Okay, then we can also describe something more complex like a ring. So L ring, what will it consist of? Oh, sorry, this is I. What will be I in L rings? Empty. Yeah, there are no relations when we talk about a ring. But what else do we have? Plus and multiplication. Yeah, if we are talking about the ring with unity, then we have, so let's see. So J is F, G, then H. So F stands for addition, J, G stands for multiplication, and H stands for inverse. So, I mean, they don't really mean anything. These are just symbols. F, G and H are not the usual symbols either. They don't mean anything, but we need so much data. And what else do we need? Zero and one, let's say. Good. <laughs> So C and E and then our uh, description is complete. So any ring is an L ring structure. Then something that we have studied in our uh, course, any ring, with any ring with identity, any unital ring, very good, any unital ring is an L ring structure. Well, I can also say that any non unital ring is also an L ring structure. I interpret C and E as zero, both of them. Yeah, and I don't ask for any other properties. Any, something else that we have studied in our course and which, which has the same signature. <coughs> Boolean algebra, very good. So a Boolean algebra given by the set, then a binary meet operation, a binary join operation, a unary negation, then two specific elements, 0 and 1, well this is an L ring structure. Because we are never asking that multiplication distributes over addition, because there is no multiplication, no addition, it's just symbols right now. Right? So, uh, you understand that this is how we do things. So, you can see now that on the first day itself <coughs> of first order logic, we are actually talking about mathematics. Propositional logic was not like that. It was only about constructing trues and false. Here we are dealing with actual mathematics now. Yeah, so it's closer to pure maths. Okay, seventh example, that's L of orders. Can you tell me what, to, what this language would be? What should be I? Singleton, okay. And it should be binary. J should be empty. And K should be empty. So any... Partial order is an L ring, uh, L order, L odd structure. I mean, partial orders already include well orders. They also include linear orders. I'm not going to write them explicitly. Then any equivalence relation. Yeah, I mean the pair A comma E. A is a set, non-empty set, and E is an equivalence relation on that, e is an L odd structure. Here we are writing some subscript because, not because it's standard, but just to make us understand what's happening. Yeah, L odd, L ring, L group, so that we have a common language to talk about. Any other structure that you can think of? which will fit the bill. What about natural numbers with order? 
and addition, multiplication, everything. So, we can combine L odd ring, L odd groups. Okay, so over here, I would consist of one binary relation symbol, then two, I mean, whole data as we had in rings and we had in L odd. Yeah, so this is two, this is two, two, one, and I mean, of course, constant symbols are zero, zero. Okay, so any, so for example, natural numbers with less equal, our usual less equal, then addition, multiplication, zero and one. Real numbers will also fit the bill, yeah? Real numbers which are ordered and they are rings. They are fields, moreover, yeah? But what doesn't fit? The collection of open subsets of real numbers, open intervals of real numbers, we cannot express that over here. I mean, we can express them. We can say that each open interval is one predicate. But then, unary predicate, but that would be complicated, yeah? We rely on some external data. What other mathematical structures have you thought of? Have you studied so far? Huh? Loudly. Matrix spaces. Vector spaces, okay? Vector spaces we can do, so let, let me just write that, L vect. Uh, but I, I will write only real vector spaces, so I need yeah, this is a, if you give me a field, then I can do it and yeah, not otherwise. Yeah, so uh, what will be the relation symbols in the case of vector space? Nothing. J, it will have addition and scalar multiplication. Yes, we'll talk about that. So, addition is binary, minus should exist, yes, so minus I will write as a unary function and then I will also write m sub r where r is in real numbers, I am using some external data and this is a unary function, yeah, mr of a is r times a, scalar multiplication and finally I will have k equal to C. Okay, so this is the language for a vector space, real vector space. If you change it to complex numbers, then a complex vector space. But you have to have some external data in here. In fact, from every given mathematical structure, you can extract its language if it is not infinitary. There should be no properties which involve infinitary operations. Okay? We cannot take, for example, yeah, in, uh, in the power set of a set, we can take arbitrary unions. Now, arbitrary unions are not allowed here because of something on the first page. It's a finitary logic. Arbitrary unions of sets are not allowed. We can only take finite unions. Okay, let's stop here.